Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to talk to you about artificial gravity. Artificial gravity is, of course, a staple of science fiction. Partly because if you're shooting a TV show or movie, it makes shooting scenes on Earth a whole lot easier. But in the early days of spaceflight, there were lots of concerns about the human body's reaction to zero-g, to the point that Yuri Gagarin would have to input a three-digit code to unlock the controls on Vostok 1, just in case being in zero-g made him space crazy. While the first decade of human spaceflight showed that humans could easily adapt to zero-g for short missions, there were many reasons to think that for longer missions, say on space stations, it would be a good idea to have access to artificial gravity capabilities for the sake of the long-term health of the crew. Specifically, it was known, even with a week or so of exposure, that the human body will slowly lose muscle and bone mass in the absence of gravity. On the engineering side of things, the laws of physics give us three ways to generate gravity-style forces for a crew. Uh, but only one of these is actually viable for spaceflight, rotational artificial gravity. You see, gravity is a phenomenally weak um, phenomenon, and while science fiction loves artificial gravity generators in the floors of spacecraft, again because it makes it easy to shoot and because it lets you design cool spaceships, there's nothing in the laws of physics that would imply or suggest that this is possible. The only way that we know right now to generate a gravity field is with a huge amount of mass, such as a planet. Planet-sized chunks of mass are great for living on, but they're kind of inconvenient to carry along if you're doing spaceflight. Now, another, another way to do this is linear acceleration, where you're going faster in a straight line. And that does indeed generate the perception of, real, uh, of gravity. Indeed, Einstein built general relativity by assuming that accelerating in a straight line and planetary gravity should be identical and no experiment can tell them apart. And guess what? That works pretty well. Now, spaceflight is great for generating linear accelerations, but you only get a few minutes during launch and re-entry. Those chemical rocket engines can deliver the g-forces you need, but only for minutes before their propellant is depleted. In TV shows like The Expanse, the spacecraft use fusion drives that can accelerate for days on end without running out of propellant. But that's a technology that is driven by the needs of the plot, and it may never be possible with uh, human technology. Also, uh, the magnetic boots that we see in the show are, again, really nice if you're trying to shoot a TV show, but uh, they really just provide a way to secure your feet to a surface without actually providing the gravity loads that make the human body work out and, uh, you know, decondition. So, rotational gravity is what's left, right? That's the only one that's possible. And indeed, the idea of large rotating space stations was around for decades before anybody ever flew in space. But a lifetime later, and we still don't see rotating space stations. Although there are many people who would love to build one, such as the Voyager space station. So, a quick reminder of the math that this involves. If you have an object that is moving in a circle, you need a force pushing it inwards towards the middle. And that force has to be proportional to the mass, the radius of the circle, multiplied by the angular velocity squared. And in physics, we measure angular velocity in radians per second. So there's, you know, two pi radians in a complete circle in two, 360 degrees. So now if you want to generate an Earth-like 9.8 meters per second of gravity with a 10 meter radius structure, that's about 30 feet, then you need to rotate it at about one radian per second or about nine and a half RPM. If you make the radius longer, then the rotation rate gets smaller, and if you reduce the gravity that you want, then similarly you can use lower rotation rates. Now at this point, I should put on my physics tutor hat and explain the difference between centripetal and centrifugal forces. For an object to move in a circle, it has to have that centripetal force pushing it towards the center of rotation. But if you are a person in a rotating space station with walls and you can't see out, um, what this force to you appears as the plate pushing the ground plate pushing up against you you feel a centrifugal force pulling you down towards the floor and that feels like gravity but this is different equal and opposite it, it look it's different enough that it can serve as a limitless source of pedantry from physicists so anyway, this kind of construction is, of course, used in training pilots and astronauts. You have the centrifuge facility. 
This is to give pilots a high experience in high G loads on the ground. You know, you'll put them in a test cabin or a test car, spin it around at high speeds and generate the G-forces that they need to learn to handle you know, to make sure that the body is capable, that the G-suit works properly, and just to teach them adaptation techniques to moments when they're dealing with this. But this kind of training is something that lasts for hours rather than the weeks or months that astronauts might experience on the space station. So, you know, this kind of rotational facility is well understood by the spaceflight community and that meant that it was also known that there were side effects from spinning humans around like this. I mean, it's honestly something we learn as kids, right? You get very dizzy if you spin around too fast. And turning those childish understanding and perceptions of dizziness and falling over into quantifiable research on human physiology is a serious endeavour that requires lots of effort, resources and dealing with people being sick. So there's two main effects that we see when humans operate in a rotating environment. Firstly, your body uses the semicircular canals near your ears to detect rotation, and that helps you keep your balance. And they do this by detecting the motion of fluid in these sort of circular um, uh, cavities. And this responds to the rotation of, the, you know, of your head. Now, if you're sitting perfectly still, your brain will take that as a non-moving reference frame and you'll stop getting dizzy if you're, even if you're rotating. But if you're returning your head, then you expect a certain rotation. If the room is turning and you turn your head, you will get a different rotation and that will confuse your brain and that will, is a great way to give yourself motion sickness. One of the first things that people learn to do in rotational experiments is to stop moving their head to minimize this effect. And the other thing is, in a rotating environment, any motion through that will frequently require forces that are different from the same motion in a non-rotating environment. These are broadly described as the Coriolis forces, which at planetary scales affect the atmospheric motions and help make tropical storms that rotate counterclockwise north of the equator and clockwise in the south. But at high rotation rates, simply reaching out your hand to pick up something might result in the fictional Coriolis force pushing your arm away from the path that your brain has planned for. You know, your brain is working with its previous experience and all your motor functions to balance this out. So when this happens, your motor control system needs to relearn how to perform these basic tasks. And you, you can learn a specific motion really quickly, minutes even. But then, you know, in some rotational environments, if you turn to face a different direction or move your hand in a different direction, the Coriolis force will again be different and you need further adaptation. It takes days to become fully adapted to a rotating environment. So one question that scientists wanted to answer was what kind of rotation rates can the human body handle for long durations? Long enough to get over that initial sickness, long enough that the gravity would need to be, uh, would be needed to avoid deconditioning of the body. Can people perform at the same levels as they do in a non-rotating environment? Or is there some penalty uh, that can't be eliminated by training at any rotation rate? Is there an upper limit on the rotating conditions that human can handle? Um, because that in turn, if you've got a limit on your rotation rates, that will set the minimum radius for a spacecraft that is using rotational artificial gravity. Now, one of the problem with all the studies like this is that they're interested in hypothetical rotating structures in space, but they have to take place on Earth. And you can't subtract Earth's gravity because we don't have anti-gravity. So one type of test is the rotating room, where a room is rotated around its vertical axis like this. And you might actually have seen this on YouTube. There's a video with Tom Scott that uh, does this. But these have been around for a long time. The US Naval Medical Research Laboratory built the slow rotating room facility in 1958. That was like 10 meters across and they had living quarters in there for long duration testing. So people would live in there for weeks on end. At one RPM, people could operate with very little adaptation, but most subjects would begin to suffer motion sickness initially when uh, the room was spinning at about three RPM. Again, turning your head was the thing that would really trip off motor si motion sickness. But from that, people could adapt uh, as you spun the room faster and faster, and they could learn to handle much higher rotation rates, even up to 10 RPM, although quite a few people couldn't adapt and ended up making frequent use of the sick bags. Yeah. 
Now, in the Soviet Union, again, they did similar experiments using rotating rooms, and they came to the same conclusions. But the rotating room isn't the same as a spacecraft rotating to provide artificial gravity, because the axis of rotation is uh, in a spacecraft is parallel to the floor, but you can't do that on Earth because of the ever-present gravity of the Earth. However, there have been tests on large centrifuges with whole living spaces at the end, with a rotation rate fast enough to incline the floor to provide a non-sloping surface for the occupants. And this means not only is the space rotating, but you're also dealing with stronger gravity. So you had better be sure that you are not going to fall over, because if you fall over due to your lack of balance, you're going to hit the ground a lot harder in these environments. So this footage here is from a Soviet experiment where, again, people would live for about a week at a time. And one of the more amusing demonstrations is the arrow throwing, where they curve around thanks to the Coriolis force. Although the elevator system uh, is also another interesting thing because, you know, you want to bring out the doctor to the crew to study them. But moving radial is really hard because, you know, your gravity forces and everything are rapidly changing as you move down this arm. It's one of the more disorienting experiences. NASA also had a very large centrifuge system. It's called the Rotating Test Facility, and it was built by Rockwell out in California. Uh, so on one side, there was this living area. It was like 40 feet long by 10 feet wide. It was actually a section of an aircraft, apparently. And people would live in this for about a week at a time. The other side, they counterbalanced this by having the walking wall. And this was a vertical wall, and they had straps to support people so they could actually stand sideways on this and test walking, like, you know, prograde and, or counter-rotation, right? They could also use this same support harness system to simulate ascending and descending ladders, because again, that's another thing that was quite complicated for your body to learn. But the only experiment I've seen that's really flown in space and provided artificial gravity is the Soviet Bion 3, or Cosmos 782 mission. So that had a small centrifuge on board it, and they had plants and animals in containers at different distances from the rotation axis, and that allowed them to compare different simulated gravitational environments. And as far as I can tell, this is the most significant test of artificial gravity ever flown in space. It's also notable as the first time a US experiment flew on a Soviet space mission. The spacecraft was actually based on the Zenit design, which was a Soviet photo reconnaissance satellite that shared a lot in common with Vostok, because back in the 50s and 60s, when Sergei Korolev was developing this, he realized he could get money from the people that wanted a human spacecraft and from the people who wanted a spy satellite and build them one spacecraft, right? Um, so yeah, all of this stuff went on for decades and the huge reports that were compiled for all these experiments. And what they all basically say is, slower is better, but rotational artificial gravity is possible in structures that are comparable to the size of the International Space Station. There would be a few engineering problems to solve to make sure like the thing remained balanced and you have you know, proper seals and transitions, but you know, there's nothing insurmountable there. Instead, we don't see rotating space stations because there's no real selling point, since the same intense medical research has helped develop ways to stave off the deconditioning associated with zero-g through consistent exercise to make up for the body not supporting your weight doing mundane things in zero-g. The ISS is primarily concerned with zero-g research, and that kind of research is hard to do in a rotating station. You would need a non-rotating section. But the ISS does miss out on the ability to perform experiments at lower gravity levels than those on Earth. I mean, at one point, there was a centrifuge facility planned for the ISS, very similar to that found in the Bion 3 satellite. And that would allow small biological payloads to be exposed for lower gravity for long periods of time. But ultimately, this was cut to make the space station more affordable. But you know, with the new wave of space tourism, there's suddenly a number of people who are interested in going into space and may find the idea of staying in space for a while, taking in the views, and who don't need experiments that are in carefully controlled microgravity. So maybe the idea of a rotating space station will finally return. In the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, the rotating space station 5 at the start, the interiors 
we get to see lounges, restaurants, and a hotel. It's not a science facility. So maybe the only thing Arthur C. Clarke got wrong was the date. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.